2022 was a very dramatic year in terms of electricity prices. And now that my solar panels have completed a second full year of electricity production, the question now is how well have they performed? So in this video, we're going to look at the electrical performance of these solar panels and the financial performance of these solar panels. I'm then going to go into particular details in relation to the faulty solar panel that we had and also some further insights into my solar edge battery bank. Finally, I'm going to make a few predictions about the state of the solar market and the electricity market for the year 2023. Now, if you haven't watched my previous videos, my name is Anthony and I own a nine kilowatt solar panel array up here in Aberdeenshire, Scotland. I've created many videos about these panels in the past and I'll invite you to go and watch those previous videos if you're interested in more details. So the headline figure is that we generated 7.2 megawatt hours of electricity during 2022. And that compares with 7.1 megawatt hours, which was shown in my quote, and seven megawatt hours for the year of 2021. So overall, we exported uh, just over 3.3 megawatt hours of electricity. And that compares with 4.6 megawatt hours of export in 2021. And it goes to show that we have a much higher utilization rate for the solar panels. And that is primarily attributed to owning an electric vehicle for the whole year. And that has been supplemented by having a fixed household battery that we charge up during the date time for eight months of the year. But conversely, we also imported more electricity. So in 2022, we imported uh, 1.9 megawatt hours of electricity. And in 2021, we imported 1.6 megawatt hours of electricity. And we imported more electricity for the same reason that we exported less. Owning an EV means that we are importing more electricity, especially over the winter time. But because that electricity is being imported overnight on the cheap prices, the impact on my electricity bill has been much smaller than it would otherwise be. So all told, for the year 2022, we returned one and a half thousand pounds worth of value from our solar panels. That was approximately a 50-50 split between energy savings in terms of self-consumption and also exports. Now, compared to 2021, we returned about £700 worth of value in that particular year. And that increase in returns represents the fact that electricity prices have been much higher. In 2021, the typical import price was 18 pence per kilowatt hour. In 2022, I was measuring savings against a 25 pence per kilowatt hour electricity tariff for import. And again, for 2021, the export tariff was five and a half pence, but in 2022, that was much closer to 20 pence per kilowatt hour. Now, for the summer months, at least, I was on the Octopus Agile tariff, but I measure savings against the Octopus Go tariff. Why do I do that? Because Octopus Go would be the tariff that I would be on if I didn't have solar panels. So if I did measure it against the Octopus Agile tariff, the savings would be even bigger because the price uh, for Octopus Agile uh, was closer to 35 pence per kilowatt hour for the whole summer time. Now, going into the year 2023, the self-consumption savings will be measured against the new Octopus Go tariff, which is just over 40 pence per kilowatt hour. That price is guaranteed until October. But as the days get longer into 2023, I will eventually switch over onto Octopus Agile and take advantage of those handsome export prices once more. Now, the output for both November and December was disappointing. We had a lot of rain in November and that led to 109 kilowatt hours of electricity being generated compared to 138 kilowatt hours the year before. However, December was tragic compared to the previous years. 
we had only 30 kilowatt hours of electricity generated compared to 70 kilowatt hours for the previous two years. My solar panels have been encased in snow and ice for the whole week. So uh, the production figures for December are looking pretty poor. Now, so far for the first three months of operation, my newly commissioned Solar Edge battery has saved me over 145 pounds worth of avoided peak time electricity consumption. Almost all of the electricity feeding the battery came from my solar panels during October. And it was only in November and December that most of my battery charging came from cheap overnight electricity. Against predicted annual returns of £600, my battery is so far not too far short of that predicted overall trend. So I want to share some further insights into how well this battery is performing. And the results are indeed very impressive. So my attention was cast onto this document. It describes the Solar Edge monitoring API. And if we turn to page 28, we see that there are two tags which we are very interested in. This is the lifetime energy charged and the lifetime energy discharged. So if we do this for my particular site, we get this. Uh, now, uh, I've found that uh, the information here is very interesting. Uh, you can see that for December 2022, 23rd of December, the lifetime energy discharge is 431 kilowatt hours and the lifetime energy charged is 445 kilowatt hours and the percentage of discharged over charged is just under 97 percent and that's impressive but it's worth reminding you that this is energy into and out from the battery it does not consider losses from the inverter to the grid now, as you may remember, inverter efficiency improves with load. So at 2 kilowatts load, the efficiency is 99%. But at 200 watts, we see a 90% efficiency. And closer to a overnight base load of 20 watts, we see the efficiency crash all the way down to 50%. Now, this is characteristic for all power supplies. It is a fact that when you're load output is zero, your power supply is still consuming energy. This is true for your USB power supply as much as a diesel driven electric generator. If you keep your load high, then you maximize your battery returns. So in my last video, I introduced a, a faulty solar panel which I had on my rooftop. It was generating just over half the output from neighboring solar panels. Now, thankfully, that's all now fixed. So let's go onto my rooftop where I'll explain a little bit more. So I sent this screenshot to JA Solar, the manufacturer of these solar panels. And the response I got back was that they suspected that there was a, an open circuit in a junction box. So they wanted me to carry out some tests on this solar panel. Essentially, what they wanted me to do was apply mechanical pressure to the junction box and see whether the voltage would return back to nominal values. Now, as you can imagine, going up onto a rooftop to retrieve a solar panel just in order to test it and then replace the solar panel to keep my roof waterproof was not going to be a particularly entertaining idea for myself. It requires a lot of labor to do that kind of test and I wasn't too pleased. But the other thing about these solar panels is that they've got a built-in optimizer. And what that means is that when you disconnect the solar panel from the roof, you will get an output from that panel of one volt. That's all you're gonna measure. So their test wasn't really going to work. So I went back to them with that information and they said, I had to complete the test. Uh, they were essentially uh, not paying attention to the technical details of the solar panels which they are selling, which was rather disappointing. So at this stage, the discussion became deadlocked. Now bear in mind that most solar panels are sold to utility companies for installation in ground-mounted solar arrays. 
access to these solar panels for testing is easy. The fact that the solar panel is on your roof is actually your problem to deal with. Now, JA Solar do set warranty conditions that require you as the owner to prove that the panel is indeed defective before they send out a replacement panel. And JA Solar can dictate the method of proof. Now, what is a very difficult task on the roof is actually a very trivial task to test on the ground. And it goes to show that you should have a spare panel in your system, which you can use to replace any faulty panel on the roof. After all, you only want to be on your roof once when you have a fault that you have to deal with. A defective panel on the ground is a much less stressful thing to deal with after all. But as it turns out, there was a wealth of information on the Solar Edge monitoring portal. This platform not only has real-time information for each panel, but it has historical information for each panel. Here's how to get to it. You go to inverter, click on the down arrow like so, okay? And then you click on the module in question, which is module 101. And then we want to have a look at module voltage. And then we want to look at optimizer voltage. So uh, what we'll do is go back to uh, the beginning of November. We'll go from the 1st until the 4th of November. And here you can see um, there is no data at night time. But what you can see here is that 1st of November, we've got uh, an optimizer output and a module output. But on the 3rd of November, you could see that towards the end of the day, the optimizer output uh, completely crashed, but the module output stayed high. And subsequently on the 4th of November onwards, the optimizer output stayed low, but the module output stayed within nominal values. This was the proof that I was seeking. And I sent this information to JA Solar and they were satisfied with it. So they went on to the next question. They wanted a commercial invoice to be supplied. Now I couldn't supply them with a commercial invoice. I just simply supplied them with the domestic installation invoice. Sadly, I didn't hear back from them. Now I did send this information to Solar Edge as well as JA Solar. I had a good feeling that Solar Edge might be more helpful and indeed they were. They confirmed that the optimizer built into the solar panel was indeed defective. Not only that, but they could simply supply me with a replacement optimizer, which arrived one week later. Now, you'd ask the question, how can you replace an embedded optimizer? Isn't it uh, difficult to do? Well, actually, they've got a technical note which describes what to do. You can bypass the optimizer that's built in and you can use the new replacement optimizer instead and uh, have that mounted underneath your solar panel. So I received the optimizer about one week later and I had my installer come out at the end of December to replace the faulty optimizer with a good one. And that was the job done. The solar panel was back up and running to nominal output levels. So you can see the whole period of time that we uh, had a bad optimizer on that particular module. All the way through, uh, this period, the module voltage was within nominal values. So then it was on the 29th of December that we got the replacement optimizer fitted. And as you can see, we're now back in business from that point onwards. So into the autumn of 2022, what I've been seeing is that electricity prices have been coming down quite a lot. With the exception of cold weather periods, the price of electricity on the wholesale market has been much cheaper than what it has been at the end of August. We're seeing uh, quite a few periods overnight on the Octopus Agile tariff where you can get uh, electricity for free or even get paid for it. There aren't too many periods like that, but if you compare this winter compared to the winter before, there were absolutely no periods which were cheap anywhere in the nighttime at all. So there is a definite softening of the electricity prices on the wholesale market. And I think that's going to translate into cheaper agile prices for import, but it also means we're going to get worse export prices this coming year. 
What I think we're going to see in terms of financial performance is much bigger savings on self-consumption measured against the Octopus Go tariff, but we're going to see much smaller export revenues. Now, not only are electricity prices coming down, but the price of solar panels is also coming down. If you look at the supply chain for solar panels, in particular, the price of polysilicon, that's really plummeting right now. What we're seeing is an expansion of manufacturing capability, especially in China. And that means that all of the components that make up solar panels are getting cheaper and supply is ramping up. And when you combine that with the fact that electricity prices are getting cheaper, I also think that the demand for solar panels will start to come off the boil as well, which means that it's worthwhile biding your time with any new solar panel installation that you're considering. So does that mean that it's no longer worthwhile investing in solar panels? Well, as I've mentioned in previous videos, you need to take a long-term view on what the performance of the solar panels is gonna be like in financial terms. I can't predict what the price of electricity is going to be beyond this year. It could get more expensive again. It could get uh, permanently cheaper. What I can say is that if you invest in solar panels, you've got an insurance product. You've got a guarantee that if the price of electricity goes high, then you are shielded from the worst effects of those electricity prices. But conversely, if the price of electricity drops away to almost zero, then you could say, well, then my investment's not paying for itself. And that's the risk that you are taking by investing in solar panels. Personally though, I think price of electricity is gonna stay high for some time, simply because many more people are investing in electric cars and the overall demand for electricity is going to go up. However, if you haven't yet committed to solar panels, it's worth holding off for a few months just to see how the market goes. So that's it for this video. Now, there was a holiday I had in New Year down to the south of Scotland. We had a lot of flooding in Dumfries and Galloway, and the result of that was that I had to divert over 100 miles in order to avoid flooded roads. Now, what ended up happening was that a five-hour journey became 11 hours and 45 minutes worth of drama. Having an electric car and having to face an additional 100 miles of driving when you're not planning for it has some challenges. So with that in mind, it goes to show that I should really have my camera rolling on a lot more trips that I'm doing. I'll make sure that mistake doesn't happen again on a future trip. But in the meantime, I'd like to thank you for watching and I'll talk to you again very soon.